It's one of the many elements of Catholic Christianity that non-Christians and many non-Catholics find incomprehensible, that Catholics celebrate, not just remember, but celebrate the martyrdom of our saints. From the earliest recorded times, the death of the martyr is described by the church as dies natalis, his or her birthday. The point at which the martyr's often excruciating agony is too much for his physical body to bear also marks his glorious and joyful birthday in heaven. The subject of this talk, Blessed Aloysius de Pinatz, Cardinal and Archbishop of Zagreb, whose dies natalis was 10th of February 1960, also experienced an agony of mind and soul and severe, prolonged and clinically untreated and unpalliated pains before his death. In beatifying him, Pope St. John Paul II, on the 3rd of October 1998, described Stepinac as a martyr, even though, said the Pope, <coughs> he did not shed his blood in the strict sense of the word, his death was caused by the long suffering he endured, end of quotation. In fact, there's good evidence that he was murdered by orders of the communist Yugoslav authorities, that his rare blood disease, polycythemia rubra vera, a catastrophic multiplication of the red blood cells, was the result of irradiation from the adjoining guard's cell while he was imprisoned at Lepoglava. In any case, Stepinac died from the conditions under which he was treated after his show trial, and he did so because of the inveterate hatred of the communists for him and for the Catholic faith, as the phrase has it, in odium fidei. Stepinac is also, however, a martyr in a certain sense for Croatia. This is not as widely grasped by contemporary Croats as it should be. Without his strength, witness, example and leadership, the Croatian Catholic Church would have been subverted, become pliant, gone down, and the historic identity of the Croat nation would have been gravely weakened. The inhabitants of Yugoslavia would doubtless have regained personal freedoms lost under communism after that system collapsed in 1989. But the rock of Croatia's identity, the basis of Croatian statehood, would have been covered up and lost amid the rubble of compromise and collaboration. Some people seem very timid about talking of Stepinac now. They're perhaps worried about annoying Pope Francis or some senior Vatican figures. There's a wider feeling among the publicly pious sort of people, what might be called the professionally Catholic laity, that Stepinac is too controversial. Talking about him and his case is deemed unecumenical. In other words, it annoys the Serbian Orthodox Church and risks annoying the more important Russian Orthodox Church, as well, of course, as annoying the Vatican. <laughs> it's in fact quite easy to annoy the Serbian Orthodox Church if you're a Croat and a Catholic. You don't really need to have to do anything at all. You're just meant to apologize. Otherwise, you are a revisionist or even worse. Let's consider what happened in the Stepinac's cause. In 1998, Stepinac was, as I said, beatified. The Serbian Orthodox Church were upset, but they got over it. And why not? The Catholic Church never tried to prevent any canonization by the Serbian Orthodox. In 2003, the Serbian Orthodox Church canonized Bishop Nikolai Velimirovic, a notorious and outspoken anti-Semite. Not so much as a squeak of objection came from the Catholics. A wealth of testimony to Stepinac's heroic virtue 
had been carefully assembled by the postulator, Monsignor Juraj Bartelia. It was thoroughly reviewed and accredited in Rome. In 2014, Cardinal D'Amato, Prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, spoke about the imminent decision on canonization. By the end of 2015, the necessary miracle had been confirmed. At this point, however, the Serbian Patriarch Irine wrote to Pope Francis to protest because of Stepinac's behaviour during the Second World War. The Pope now held back from confirming the canonization. Instead, a Vatican-chaired mixed commission, as it was called, of Catholic and Orthodox bishops and experts worked through all the accusations during 2016 and they reported in July 2017. A series of papers were produced, all of those of any substance coming from the Catholic side, uh, answering the accusations. The papers also, in examining the conditions prevailing at the time of the Axis power occupation, highlighted in some detail the Serbian Orthodox Church Episcopal leadership's enthusiastic collaboration with the Nazis. This went far beyond anything of which the Catholic hierarchy can be charged. The contents of these papers was suppressed, and it is still suppressed, and you cannot read it. I can, actually, because I have a copy, but I don't own the copyright. The reason was, presumably, that ecumenism would be impeded. Well, two interesting things have happened since all of this. One is that the former Serbian Orthodox Zagreb Metropolitan Porfirije, now Serbian Patriarch, has publicly set about destabilizing Montenegro and its autocephalous church through his intervention, inevitably provoking violence. The other is that Patriarch Kirill of Moscow has publicly supported and encouraged the brutal, bloody war launched by Putin against Ukraine. One wonders, really, whether ecumenism with the Orthodox is a good enough reason to refuse to canonize someone whom the most thorough investigation has found to be a saint. The campaign to discredit Stepinac is still underway. The opening of the archives of Pope Pius XII has also opened a new route for Serbian researchers and thus, indirectly, their fifth column of media savvy Croat allies to uh, unearth and publicize documents which can be presented as new and damaging evidence. Some such evidence has already appeared, and more certainly will. The Croats, by contrast, cannot at present be bothered to go to Rome to do any research themselves. But this really isn't so surprising when we consider that Croatia does not even currently have an ambassador to the Holy See to represent its interests there because of an internal and completely irrelevant political squabble. Well, anyway, I leave the point there. Stepinac's spiritual significance is not my main subject, but anyone who reads his life with an open mind and a knowledge of Catholic teaching about the virtues, above all the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, must be struck by the man's towering Christian character. Any Catholic who struggles with such matters, and even those who find them easy, will be impressed by his purity and asceticism. He had a deep devotion from his childhood to the very moment of his death to the Blessed Virgin Mary. He drove forward the promotion and embellishment of Maria Bistrica, as the national shrine of Croatia, and he visited it as a pilgrim every year from 1935 to 1945. He showed absolute fidelity to the church, Catholic teaching, and the Pope, and he suffered dearly for it. Catholics and non-Catholics alike must admire his vigorous charity. 
For example, his establishment of the Zagreb Caritas for the poor in the 1929-33 economic crisis. His work for Jews expelled in 1938 from Austria and Czechoslovakia was imaginative and active, as I shall describe. His protection of Jews under the independent state of Croatia, Nezavisna Država Hrvatska, or NDH, was even more so, as I shall also describe. To my mind, given all that he suffered, perhaps his most remarkable quality was his capacity to forgive. To forgive those whose ideology he fought and who, in return, persecuted him. We have a detailed account from the diary of Father Josip Vranekovic, parish priest of Krasic, where Stepinac was interned from 1951 to 1960, of the Archbishop's thoughts, words and actions. He insisted repeatedly on the need for forgiving one's enemies, including those that he knew were spying on him and betraying him. When he heard of that tyrant's death, he immediately prayed for Stalin's soul. Let me say something more about Stepinac's character. <clears throat> he was well educated and well read, but he wasn't an intellectual. He was clever, but not original. His sermons are solid, but not exciting. He was, though, a most unusual Archbishop of Zagreb. He had fought in the First World War, he'd seen killing, he'd been captured, he'd been held as a POW. Unlike nearly all his predecessors, he was not a born gentleman. He was a hardened peasant. His family were of that distinctive, established, well-to-do class of farmers, which has been totally lost in modern times, which was, but which was the bedrock of Central European stability. When appointed as a bishop, coadjutor with right of succession to the Archbishopric of Zagreb, Aloysia was very young, 34, beneath the canonical age, and so he needed a permission from Rome. He was vigorous. He was radical. The late Ivo Barnatz once said to me that he thought Stepinac was scary, and I'm sure he was a bit. He certainly scared, I think, all who wanted a quiet and easy life. This produced tensions with the wealthy canons of the cathedral on Kaptol in the 1930s and again in the 1950s, albeit for different reasons. Initially, some of the canons thought that money should not be thrown around on new parishes. Later, they thought that they could do a deal with the communists over matters at issue to protect their curie, their mansions. Well, Stepinac was having none of it. He set about the creation of new parishes to deal with the greatly expanded population of Zagreb. There were just five parishes to begin with, but eventually he founded 14 more, and most of today's Zagreb parishes and their churches were founded by him. This activity meant trouble with the communists, now making headway among the industrial working class. The foundation of the parish of St. Joseph in working class Treshnevka was deemed a special provocation. Stepinac in his sermon there attacked Marx and held up St. Joseph as the model for working men. So there was competition and hostility from the party right from the 1930s. The 30s also too saw two great political encyclicals of Pius XI both of March 1937, which form an important part of the Stepinac story. Mit Brennen der Zorga, condemned National Socialism, Divine Redemptoris, condemned Atheistic Bolshevism. This twin rejection of inhuman, indeed anti-human, totalitarianism was the basis of Stepinac's political outlook in the years that followed. He was not interested in politics, and he tried to keep himself and his priests out of it, though with limited success. Throughout, however, he knew what he rejected. 
I mentioned earlier Stepinac's significance as a Croat. The sneering remark of President François Mitterrand, which became the title of an influential book by Alain Finkielkraut, Comment peut-on être croat? How can one, meaning anybody, be a croat? Sums up a problem faced by modern croats who have been struggling to assert their identity. They've had the challenge of recapturing and establishing continuity with the Croatian historic identity which preceded both fascism and communism. They needed a sound basis for self-respect and self-confidence. And in a sense, of course, the Croatian War of Independence has since done all that for them, albeit at a terrible cost. But looking more closely at the experience of totalitarianism, we can say that Stepinac has a unique role. Stepinac shows Croats the way. And remember that Marta, in Greek, literally means witness. He's shown Croats the way to look at events. That is through the eyes of a patriotic Croat who at every stage wanted to do what was just, charitable and good. He dealt with three highly unpleasant regimes and he dealt with each in an exemplary fashion. Karadjordjevic Yugoslavia from 1918 to 1941, the Indeha, the independent state of Croatia, from 1941 to 1945, and communist Yugoslavia from 1945 to his death in 1960. And I shall deal briefly with each of these in turn, trying to clear up some misunderstandings and, en passant, refute some lies. Well, Stepinac was chosen as Archbishop Coadjutor with the right of succession in 1934, because he was the only candidate acceptable both to the Vatican and to King Alexander in Belgrade. He was thought by the latter to be reliably Yugoslav because he had been a so-called Salonika volunteer. That is, he fought, though in fact the fighting had already stopped by the time he got there, on the Yugoslav side <coughs> at the end of the First World War. The Catholic Church began by being enthusiastically and somewhat naively in favour of the new Karadjordjevic Yugoslavia. This attitude, however, shifted because of the 1928 assassination of Croat leaders in the Belgrade Parliament, and then specifically the refusal of that Parliament, under Serbian Orthodox Church pressure, to ratify the 1937 Concordat with the Vatican. The first Yugoslavia at least until the fragile achievement of partial Croat self-government through the Banovina Hrvatska in 1939, was in essence a greater Serbia disguised beneath federal institutions. The abuses were numerous and intolerable. The coup of 27th of March 1941 that overthrew the Yugoslav regent Prince Paul, ostensibly because Yugoslavia signed the tripartite pact with the Axis powers, was also aimed at ending this confederal arrangement. Stepinac, like the great majority of Croats, welcomed the collapse of Yugoslavia and the proclamation of an independent state of Croatia in April 1941. He ordered a Te Deum to celebrate it. He never regretted it or apologized for it, and he maintained at his trial and to the end of his life that Croats had the right to their own state. But Stepinac was always hostile to the Nazis, who were equally suspicious of him, as was the new ruler Ante Pavlic, Poglavnik, and leader of the Ustasha Croatian fascist movement. The Gestapo in Graz had already described Stepinac as anti-German, deutschfeindlich for his attempts to save the Jews. Pavlic complained about Stepinac's attitude at his first meeting with Hitler. Stepinac had cold but formally respectful relations with the Poglavnik. Their first meeting lasted just a quarter of an hour. 
At it, Stepinac asked Pavlic if he had been involved in the assassination of King Alexander of Yugoslavia in 1934. Pavlic, who must have thought the question naive, lied and said that he had nothing to do with it. Within three weeks of the proclamation of the new state, Stepinac wrote a strong letter of protest to Pavlic about the murder of 260 Serbs at Glina. He kept on writing letters of protest. Initially, he seems to have believed that Pavlic himself wanted to stop the killing, which then provoked a full-scale Serb uprising in the summer of 1941. Stepinac soon, however, became more open in his public criticism. This took the form of sermons on major occasions. The Catholic press at the time was heavily censored, but the big sermons draw, drew huge crowds. Stepinac's sermons were reported by Vatican and Western radio and reprinted in Western newspapers. Here are extracts from his sermon on the Feast of Christ the King on 25th of October 1942, attacking the doctrine of racism. All nations and races come from God. In reality, there exists one race, and that is God's race. Its birth certificate is to be found in the book of Genesis, when the hand of God formed the first man out of dust from the ground and breathed into him the breath of life. The members of that race can have a higher or lower level of culture, can be white or black, can be divided by oceans, can live at the north or the south pole. But essentially they remain the race which comes from God and which must serve God according to the norms of the natural law and the positive law of God, written in the hearts and souls of men and manifested through the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the ruler of all nations. He goes on. Every nation and every race that today exists on earth has the right to a life worthy of man and to be treated in a manner worthy of man. All of them without distinction, whether members of the race of gypsies or any other, be they blacks or polished Europeans, be they hated Jews or proud Aryans, they all equally have the right to say, Our Father who art in heaven. And if God has granted to all of them that right, what earthly authority can deny it? Therefore, he concludes, the Catholic Church has always condemned and condemns today every injustice and violence which is committed in the name of theories of class, race or nationality. The policy of the Indecha of killing the Serbs was its own. It was a manifestation of extreme Croat nationalism and the desire for revenge. The policy of killing Roma was probably borrowed from National Socialism, but pursued with homegrown enthusiasm. The policy of liquidating the Jews was, however, a requirement from the Third Reich, and particularly Himmler. The Ustasha complied and used it to steal Jewish property, but the Endeha authorities had constantly to be pressed by Berlin to do more. The Catholic Church in Croatia had been at odds with Jewish intellectuals. Some were Freemasons. Jewish doctors were also willing to perform abortions. But unlike in Serbia, where the Orthodox Church, like other Orthodox churches, gave frequent vent to anti-Semitism, the Croatian Catholic Church was not anti-Semitic. Significantly, but often forgotten, the German military command was able to report that Serbia was free of Jews, Judenfrei, a year before the final Jews, after a visit from Himmler, were rounded up in Croatia. Stepinac himself had good personal relations with the Jews. He had greeted refugees at Zagreb station in 1938 as they fled from Austria and Czechoslovakia and helped the Jewish community get them papers to leave for safer countries. At the request of Jews who came to him, he performed private baptisms so they could claim or try to claim the protection afforded to converts. By stubborn refusals to be quiet 
and by pointing out to Pavlich the hypocrisy of the Ustasha's conduct, since a number were married to Jews, and Pavlich's own wife was half Jewish, Stepinats saved the Jews who were married to Gentiles from liquidation. He was particularly close to the Zagreb chief rabbi Miroslav Shalom Freiberger, and he intervened at Freiberger's request, for example, for the evacuation of Jewish children. The archbishop organized the transfer of the residents of the Jewish old people's home and accommodated them secretly in his summer residence till the end of the war, thus saving them from dispatch to Auschwitz. When, in May 1943, the order came for the final roundup of Jews, Stepinatz offered Freiberger and his family protection in the Archbishop's palace. The chief rabbi, however, refused, deciding that he must accompany his people to Auschwitz. The Jewish community entrusted its library to the Archdiocese for safekeeping, which returned it intact after the war. Esther Gitman, the historian of Jewish rescue in the NDH, and herself a Holocaust survivor, has written in her study of the subject this. During my travels throughout the countries of the former Yugoslavia, Israel and the United States, the name most frequently mentioned in my 72 testimonies is that of Archbishop Stipinats. At the show trial of Stepinatz in 1946, there's no mention of the Jews, and not surprisingly given the facts. Jewish witnesses were also discouraged by Stepinatz's lawyer from returning to testify for him because of the risks to them. Those Serbs who were willing to testify were prevented by threats and other obstruction for doing, from doing so. One of the main accusations made then and since against Stepinats and the Catholic Church concerns the forced conversion of Orthodox Serbs to become Catholics. Now this needs to be cleared up because it is, by and large, at least the way it is presented, nonsense. The NDH had a policy, agreed with Hitler, of shifting a large part of the Serb population in Croatia to Serbia in exchange for which Slovenes would be transported from German annexed Slovenia. Under cover of this policy, Ustasha bands, possibly acting without the authority of Pavlic, but also knowing they would not be held to account by him, terrorized and murdered many Croatian Serbs. This then led to an uprising and the strengthening of Serb Chetnik bands already working under the loose authority of Draža Mihailović, themselves murdering and plundering Croats and Muslims in pursuit of an ethnically pure Greater Serbia. Meanwhile, there was a process of mass liquidation going on in almost complete secrecy, known only to a limited number of Ustaše directed by Pavlić and Max Luboric at the Jesenovac concentration camp and elsewhere. After the first phase, that is the deportation of Serbs, failed, the NDH tried to pacify the remaining Serb population. As part of this, and before the final phase, which was the creation of a Croatian Orthodox Church to which Orthodox, loyal Croatian Serb citizens could belong, there was a short period during which many Serbs tried to convert to Catholicism in order to save their lives. Catholic identity being taken as proof of one's loyalty to the Croatian state. The NDH authorities encouraged this for a time by sending out missionaries, priests under instructions from the secular authorities, to conduct the required conversions. Many thousands of Serbs took advantage of the process. As Stepinac pointed out at his trial, this did not amount to rebaptism as the communist, communists constantly claimed, the Catholic Church, after all, recognizes orthodox baptism. The Catholic Church, at least in those days, was keen to bring schismatics, as it considered then and officially considers the orthodox now to be, back into full communion with the Church. But neither Pius XII nor Stepinac, 
who at every point referred back to the Pope and constantly enjoyed his support, wanted insincere conversions. Consequently, following canon law, the bishops publicly insisted on a full process of catechetical instruction and proof of a sincere intention to be a Catholic before Orthodox, or Jews for that matter, were admitted. The Catholic bishops publicly rejected the attempts by Endeha authorities to involve themselves and they rejected too the work of these unauthorized missionaries. The demand for conversion, so-called, came from the Serbs themselves, but tragically it did not usually save their lives. Ustasha bands often came and killed them just the same. Communist propaganda created out of this matter a huge scandal, which is still mentioned by people who do not know the facts, as proof of the intolerance of the Catholic Church. In fact, however, Stepinac privately took a different line, one which he did not later admit to in court. Though it might have helped him, he was, after all, a stickler for canon law, and he certainly in this matter broke the letter of that law. As already noted, he baptized Jews at their request when they said it would save their lives. Well, he also sent confidential instructions to the, priest of his, the priests of his archdiocese regarding the Serbs as well. Now, the original document has been lost, but there's no doubt of the authenticity of the text, and it reads as follows. When you are approached by people of the Jewish or Orthodox religion who are in danger of death and they want to convert to Catholicism, receive them to save human lives. Do not demand of them any religious knowledge because the Orthodox are Christians like us and the Jewish religion is that from which Christianity draws its roots. The role and task of the Christian, first of all, is to save lives. When this time of madness and savagery passes, those who were converted for reasons of conviction will stay in our church, while the rest, when the danger passes, will return to their own. Thirdly, one must mention the interventions that Stepinas made with the Indeha authorities for those facing persecution and death. He intervened for Jews, Serbs, Communists, hostages taken by the Germans, Orthodox clerics seized by the Ustasha, Freemasons, women, children, Croat soldiers facing execution, and Slovene priests in concentration camps. He used the institutions of the church, notably Caritas, to save and accommodate thousands of Serb children with Catholic families. He turned his garden into a shelter for them. His palace hid them. His summer residence accommodated elderly Jews and little children alike. For the defense at his trial, the archdiocese gathered lists of his interventions, though these are just a fraction of the whole. Those lists cover more than 200 typed pages of names and dates. We must now turn to the trial and to the attempt to destroy Stepinac's and the church's reputation. It should be said that the official court record is falsified. It omits Stepinac's and his lawyer's defense speeches and the fact that he denied writing what was a forged document attributed to him. It also omits the damning damning for the prosecution, that is, evidence of the few defence witnesses that were called. These are shown in the transcript, which is now residing and which you can consult in the Croatian State Archive. When the partisans entered Zagreb on Tuesday 8th of May, Stepinac stayed. There's a suggestion that Tito, who hated him, had decided to have him killed at once, but was persuaded not to anyway. It was a risk. The initial execution of collaborators at the end of May was of other leading clerics, including Bishop Pop, head of the Lutherans, Ismet Muftic, the Zagreb Mufti, the leaders of the Croatian Orthodox Church, 
along with ten Catholic priests and two nuns. Stepinac was, however, treated warily. He was invited to attend the partisan celebrations, including the military parades, though he soon gave up, disgusted by what else he could see happening. The point is that initially he was not regarded, at least publicly, as a war criminal. This then changed. His first arrest and interrogation was on the 17th of May 1945, but this was exploratory, what would now be called a fishing expedition. The interrogators were frustrated and they determined to find more material. Meanwhile, with Stepinac out of the way, Tita met the leaders of the Archdiocese of Zagreb, hoping to win them over to his plans for a compliant philo-communist church. These plans were vague. The autocephalous, or state, or independent, or people's orthodox church model clearly attracted him. He said he wanted a, I quote, more national church. Tito said he spoke like this, I quote again, as a Catholic and a Croat. A typical Tito lie. The word Catholic was later removed from the record. Tito had one interview with Stepinac. At it, the Archbishop asked him to have discussions with and indeed seek support from non-communists. Tito, however, talked darkly about justice. They never met again. Systematic persecution of the Catholic Church, meanwhile, and despite assurances from the authorities, continued. Stepinac's protests and letters went unanswered, or his complaints were contemptuously rejected. The big change towards him came after the issue at his insistence by the Catholic bishops in September of a ferocious and comprehensive attack on the abuses and murders authorized by the new regime. Several hundred Catholic priests, seminarians, and members of religious orders had been killed. Many were in jail. Church property had been confiscated. Church institutions, including Caritas, had been suppressed. Seminaries couldn't function. The church newspapers had been stopped. Crosses were taken out of schools. Atheistic propaganda was being taught. The pastoral letter was the last entirely free statement by the Catholic Church in communist Yugoslavia until the collapse of that state. And it concludes as follows. We seek, and we will never under any circumstances withdraw from this, we seek complete freedom of the Catholic press, complete freedom of Catholic schools, complete freedom of religious education in all classes of junior and middle schools, complete freedom of Catholic association, complete freedom of Catholic charitable activity, complete freedom of the human person and his inalienable, inalienable rights, complete respect for Christian marriage and the return of all foundations and institutions seized. Only under these conditions can the affairs in our state be settled and lasting internal peace be achieved. End of quotation. Stepinac realized that the consequences would be severe, but he never regretted what he'd done. His car was stoned. He was effectively unable to leave Kaptol. The Archbishop was also ensnared in a complicated plot involving the returned Ustasha secret police chief, Chief Erich Lisak. And Stepinac's name was then added partway through to the trial of various Ustasha, Franciscans and Stepinac's secretary. The Archbishop was arrested at 5.30 on the morning of Wednesday 18th of September when preparing to say a Mass. Some important points need to be made about the trial. The five charges were, first, assisting the occupiers, secondly, the so-called forced baptisms, which I already dealt with, and third, the fact that Stepinac was military vicar to the Endeha armed forces, which was in fact a mere formality. 
The bishops had requested that he be appointed vicar to Catholics serving in the Yugoslav armed forces because the soldiers needed priests to confess them, and he was unofficially, sine titulo, also military vicar under the Endeha. Pavlic, not Stepinac, made the appointment of Ustasha priest military vicars. The fourth charge was support for the Indeha. Finally, there was the charge of hostile propaganda, which, insofar as the Archbishop was indeed hostile to communism, was the only one of substance. The trial was not a judicial process, except as mere formality. There was no possibility of the accused being found innocent, and the purpose was overtly political. There was always political logic at work. The case was to be a counterbalance to appease Serb opinion for the trial of the Chetnik leader Draža Mihailović in June 1946. Pavlic having fled, Stepinac was the highest profile Croat victim available. The elimination and discrediting of Stepinac was also intended to remove the main obstacle to gaining a pliant Catholic Church. Now this was understood by Tito, and it was even more clearly understood by Monsignor Svetozar Ritik, who was advising the Marshal on such matters. And we cannot be surprised. As totalitarians, the Communists were determined to have total control over every institution in society. And the most important independent institution in Croatia, once the, Catholic, once the Croatian Peasants' Party had been subverted, split and then crushed, was the Catholic Church. The Serbian Orthodox Church, by contrast, and with a few exceptions, quickly became compliant. The collaborative arrangement was symbolized by the return from abroad to Serbia of Patriarch Gavrilo in November 1946. From then on, the Serbian Orthodox Church and the Communists in Belgrade promoted the same line about Stepinac, the Catholic Church, and Pius XII. And they still do. The trial had also an external dimension. It was closely modelled on Soviet show trials. Soviet involvement in the planning is indeed likely at this date. An early example of such trials of leading Catholic prelates, though not the very first, was that of Cardinal Slippy, head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, in 1945. Cardinal Beran, Archbishop of Prague, suffered the same fate in 1949. Cardinal Mincenti, Prince Primate and Archbishop of Estegom, endured his specially cruel show, show trial in the same year in Hungary. The Stepinac trial and its accompanying propaganda must also be understood as part of the long-term program of slander directed against Pius XII. Again, it still is. The theme was taken up by John Cornwell in his book Hitler's Pope, which is heavily based on Carlo Falcone's The Silence of Pius XII, published in 1965. Falcone's treatment of Croatia, for which he had the cooperation of the Udba and the uh, Communist Party that directed it, uh, as the available records now show, without doubt, takes up a third of his book. The trial was not, it is true, as ruthless as Mincenti's, but it was no less weighted against the accused. An important and still quoted forgery was part of it. An alleged report written by Stepinac to Pius XII of 18th of May 1943 defending the Endeha government and drawing satisfaction from the mass conversion of Serbs. Witnesses whom the defence wished to call were vetoed at will by the prosecutor, the state prosecutor, Yakov Blažević. The production of written testimony was also vetoed. The documents showing all this, marked by the prosecutor in red da or ne, can be seen today at the Stepinac Museum in Zagreb. The defence asked for 37 witnesses to be called. They were allowed 22, but only eight in fact turned up. 
of whom one was then driven out. The others were interrupted and jeered at. Stepinac was sentenced to 16 years hard labour. He was sent to Lepoglava prison. He was not tortured, but he was very probably poisoned. The official post-mortem is obviously unreliable. His body was suspiciously destroyed by acid when it should have been embalmed. The heart, which was secretly removed by one of the clinicians, a Catholic, as a relic, was later taken by the Udba and burnt, perhaps to destroy traces of poison. In 1996, examination of some of the physical remains prior to beatification performed by the Department of Chemistry at La Sapienza University in Rome discovered traces of cadmium, arsenic and chromium which would not normally be present and which suggest irradiation. Stepinac served five years in Lepoglava. He was eventually released in 1951 as a result of American pressure. He was then interned in the parish priest's house at Krasic, where he had been born in Krasic. The conditions he endured sharply worsened after he received from Pius XII, the same time as the similarly imprisoned Archbishop of Warsaw, Stefan Wyszynski, his cardinal's hat in December 1952. The appointment was the occasion for Yugoslavia to break off diplomatic relations with the Holy See. But it was by no means the only cause. The authorities were, in truth, far more concerned about the successful attempts of Stepinac from his place of exile and supported by a handful of other brave bishops to prevent the subversion of the church by the Communist Party through the Communist Front so-called professional priests' associations. Stepinac sent letters out via the nuns who looked after him to encourage bishops and priests in that struggle. Those who joined the associations could enjoy many privileges, as well in many cases as release from prison and protection from harsh persecution. They got pensions and they were relieved of taxes. The documents we have are quite clear. These bodies were devised and controlled by the secret police, the Udba. A significant battle was won by the communists in Slovenia and Bosnia and Herzegovina in promoting the associations, but it was lost in Croatia. It was lost, and mainly because of Stepinac. Stepinac thus served, saved the church in Croatia from going the way of Hungary as an ecclesiastical shell for communist activity, a situation graphically described by Cardinal Mincenti in his protest written in 1974 when, under Ostpolitik, he was removed by the Vatican. Just as significantly, Stepinac got the Vatican to approve the consecration of his successor as coadjutor archbishop, Franjo Schepper. The secular authorities were not consulted or even informed. Unlike in Hungary and elsewhere, no veto was exercised by the government in Yugoslavia, that is the Communist Party, against nomination of Catholic bishops whom the authorities considered suspect. Many, perhaps most, of the leading Croats at that time, including even those who were hostile to communism, thought that this great struggle with the party had been lost. But Stepinac never believed for a moment that communism would triumph. This for him was quite simply a matter of faith. As he wrote to his friend, the sculptor Ivan Meshtrovich, just eight months before his own death, it is absolutely impossible that this monstrous system should ever win people's hearts. I probably shall not live to see the collapse of communism in the world because of my broken health, but I am absolutely certain of that collapse. Whatever is built against nature as God created and established it 
must collapse by internal necessity. Satan lost the battle on Calvary, and I am certain that he will lose it on the Calvary of the mystical Christ that is the church, which today is passing over its own Golgotha. Stepinac was, of course, proved right. The practical legacy of blessed Aloysius Stepinac was a church that, despite some informants and collaborators, at all levels, as the archives show, despite that, was solidly faithful to the teaching of the church and to Rome. As a result, when in 1966 diplomatic relations between the Holy See and Yugoslavia were restored, and when in 1970 a full easing of relations began, the communists found to their dismay that they had lost the battle to subvert the Croatian Catholic Church. The faithful, through silence and suffering, had remained true to the faith and not been swayed by the half-truths of party-approved liberal Catholicism. The Croatian Catholic Church, under Stepinac's spiritual son and lifelong devotee, Archbishop Franjo Kuharic, was now in the position to help destroy communist rule in Croatia and to strengthen Croatian resolve in its time of trial. All this is what Croatia owes to Stepinac and to the Catholic Church, which Stepinac served, loved and died for, and which will, God willing, sooner or later be able to venerate him with the whole world as another canonized Croat saint.